And the Apostle Paul went on to say, after he said, thank you for your, your gifts and your love and your kindness, he said, I work really hard to this end. In fact, he used the word, I agonize and I struggle to this end, that Christ would be developed fully in your life, that, that I would be able to present you to God as mature, as mature in Christ. This was Paul's reason why he did what he did. It's why we do what we do. And what does it look like to be mature in Christ? That's exactly what we've been talking about. It looks like being filled with the Holy Spirit and walking in the Spirit. That's what we're learning. Who's the Holy Spirit? What does He do? And what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? I know that that term can sound so ethereal, so it is kind of out there, like it's a real spiritual thing, but it's really very practical. Um, I'm known for walking fast. I used to think Renee walked slow, now I know, nope, I just walk fast. And, uh, and to walk in the Spirit, what does it look like? Well, let's do this. Anthony, you can help me for just a minute, will you please? So practically, to walk in the Spirit means I follow where the Spirit goes. So if you're the Spirit, just go. And so, oh, if I'm going to follow the Spirit, say, oh, I wasn't going to go there today, but I've got to follow the Spirit. And it's like, but I really, I don't want to go talk to them because they're really mean to me. No, but I'm supposed to. So I'll follow the Spirit. I'll go. You can even walk faster because sometimes Spirit goes fast. I'm just going to go wherever the Spirit goes. It means you've got to adjust what you were doing. Now, here's the thing. I'm going to stop following you now, Anthony, but thank you. Thank you. The scriptures say, if you walk by the Spirit, if you keep in step with the Spirit. Say if. if. Well, if means we have a choice, don't we? We can choose to be led by the Spirit, to keep our lives in step with the Spirit, or we can choose to do what we want to do, to do what we feel like doing. If we're hurt, let us hurt back. But if we choose to be led by the Spirit and to keep in step with the Spirit, Listen, look what he will produce inside of you. Galatians 5.22 says, he will produce in you, the Spirit will, as you are led by the Spirit. He'll produce in you love, joy, peace. Yep, faithfulness, gentleness, goodness, self-control. He will produce that inside of your life. That means God, as a follower of Jesus, God is working in you. Philippians 2.13, God himself is working in you to do what? To produce in you love, joy, peace. What a thought. God working in you. To produce something in you that you could not produce in yourself. It is the fruit, the results. It's the evidence. You know, the scriptures say we should give ourselves regular spiritual checkups to find out whether we're in Christ or not. To see whether Christ is really in us or if we're just talking. If it's all talk. I'm paraphrasing just a little bit. You can read it in 2 Corinthians 13, uh, 5 and 6, I believe. So we should give ourselves regular spiritual checkups to see if Christ is really in us. Well, how do you know if Christ is really in you? Does your life display? Do you see the results of the Spirit being inside of you that you walk toward, you walk in, you're keeping in step with the Spirit by walking in love? Romans 5.5 5 says, the Holy Spirit pours out God's love inside of us. Are we being faithful? Pastor Joe talked about faithfulness last week. Are we walking in faithfulness? What is faithfulness? I am faithful. I stick with God. I cannot be moved in my conviction for who Jesus is and what he did for me. Faithfulness means I'm in for the long haul. I'm not looking for greener grass. I'm making greener grass. Faithfulness. And now we're going to come to this word. We're going to talk about joy. You know, one of the things that God produces in you is joy. Some of you thought, oh, joy, that's just for those really happy people. Just those people. But I'm just more like black and white, or I just see it the way it really is. Some of you thought that joy was only for those people that didn't really live real life. They didn't know the anguish and the pain of real life. But no, no, joy is something that God produces inside of us. Joy, let's be clear, joy is not happiness. Happiness is based on happenings. So sometimes what happens is bad. Sometimes what happens is good. If we live our life based on what happens, we're going to be all over the map, aren't we? Like, I remember hearing wedding vows that said, we, we commit to each other, so these were the vows, so long as we both are happy. Ah! How long is that marriage going to last? I'm not sure you're going to make it 
through the eight hours. I just heard someone say, maybe eight hours. So that's, that's what happiness is. It's based on what happens. And if you live real life, you know sometimes what happens is good. Sometimes what happens is really bad. Joy is an inner, it's inside, it's inward, it's on the inside of you, and it cannot be touched by anything that happens in this world. It's an inner calm, exceeding gladness that comes from God. It's actually his joy. Do you know that uh, joy... This is, this, is, this is the desire of Jesus that would be filled with his joy. Joy is a sign of spiritual maturity. It's a sign, that, oh, the spirits, it's just not a sign of somebody having a good day or a bad day. Joy, exceeding gladness, is a sign that the spirit as it work, is at work inside of you. Isn't that something? Okay, everybody do me a favor. Put your hands together for our downtown campus. We're so glad you're with us. We love you. Thank God for you. Joy. I'm telling you, joy is a sign of spiritual growth. It's a sign I'm growing. Jesus said this in John 15, 11. He said, I've told you all these things. Stop right there. What things? He said, if you abide in me, remain in relationship with me, let my love remain in you and you remain in my love and be obedient to my word. Okay, if you do that, then I'm telling you all these things so that my joy is in you and your joy is full. Did you catch that? That the desire of Jesus is that his joy would be inside of you. Then your joy would be full. Well, I don't know about you, but I want the joy of Jesus inside of me. If I'm led by the Spirit. If I cooperate, this is why we said that life in the Spirit is not life on autopilot, that everything's just going to happen. There's that, that little giant word, if. If. So the Spirit is working in you relentlessly to produce in you love, joy, and peace. But he does not do that independent of you, but in cooperation with you. So this is why we, we cooperate and as we cooperate with the Holy Spirit, we get the joy of Jesus inside of us. I don't know, think of the most joy-filled person you know. What does the joy of Jesus look like? Hey, he endured the cross. He endured the worst of the worst for the joy, that's you and me, that was set before him. You can have the joy of Jesus. Now, some may say, well, Pastor Jeff, that all sounds really good to have joy and the joy of Jesus and for my joy to be filled, but, but Pastor, you just got to get real. Let's, let's talk where real life is. What about when there's suffering? Right about, what about when things are very difficult? Do you know the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6.10, he said this, our hearts ache and yet we're, we always have joy. Well, how can that be? How can it be? that our hearts ache, and yet we're full of joy at the same time. That's not talking about having multiple personalities. That's talking about something that is available. Oh, we don't have to live without the joy of Jesus being inside of us. We get to live in moments where our hearts ache, and yet always having joy. I know for some of you, this year's been difficult, and it has been filled with heartache, some of you have ended up in places you never thought you would be. You landed in a hospital. You never thought that would be you. You were in an ER, and you never thought you would be there. Some were in a funeral home, and you didn't think that was going to be where this year was going to take you, but you landed there. Some had a spouse walk out on you, and you find yourself single again. So I know some of you know very well the tension of relationships when things get difficult, and I want to encourage you today that joy comes you might not feel it yet, but Psalms 35 says this, weeping, weeping lasts for the night, but joy comes in the morning. So I'm telling you, friend, joy is coming. Joy is coming. Every time you see a UPS truck go by, you say, yep, and joy is coming my way. It's not from UPS, I doubt, but joy is coming. Joy is a sign of spiritual progress. 
And that means that even when, I love, I love this, even though, this even though portion of Scripture in Habakkuk chapter 3, and you might want to even rewrite this with your own story inside of it, but it says this in Habakkuk 3, verse 17, 18, it says, even though the fig trees have no blossoms, there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crops fail, the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields, in the cattle barns, they're empty. Here we go, verse 18. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. What does that tell us? That means even though COVID doesn't seem to want to go go away, yet I will rejoice. Even though the worst of the worst happened, oh, but even though, yet I will rejoice. I'm not rejoicing because bad happened. I'm rejoicing in the Lord. I'm rejoicing about who he is. Apostle Paul said in Philippians 4, speaking about joy as being a sign of spiritual growth and maturity, he said these words. He said, always be full of joy. So I say it again, rejoice always. That's a pretty tall order, isn't it? Always rejoice. Be full of joy. I say again, rejoice. If you're familiar with that passage, you know that he wrote that when he was in jail, when he was in prison. Paul knew something about what it meant to have joy in difficulty. In Acts chapter 16, we find that the Apostle Paul, who's telling us, always be joyful. Well, he was living life, obeying God. He's on a missions trip, and they meet a girl who's Demon-possessed, they cast the demon out of her. And what happens? But they land in jail. And they're beaten and locked up. And you know what the Scripture says in Acts 16? They were singing hymns to God. And it says, and everybody was listening. Well, of course they were listening. Who else is singing when you've been wrongly, unjustly treated and beaten and things aren't right? And how, God, how could this be? And yet what came out of them How could that even be? It has to be the joy of Jesus inside of you. That even though the worst happened, what comes out is, is Lord, but look who you are. Like, look look what you're going to do. Like, I know something good is coming. I know joy is coming my way. Joy. It's a sign of spiritual growth. And we get to have joy even in those moments where it's even though moments. Always, such a big word, isn't it? Always be full of joy. I want you, if you have your Bibles, go to Philippians 4 4 because the context of when he said always be full of joy is really important. If we rewind just a little bit, go back to verse 2, he said, He said, I appeal to these two ladies, please. Because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. I ask you, my true partner, help these two women, for they've worked hard with me in telling others the good news. They've worked with others of my co-workers whose names are written in the book of life. Then he says, always be full of joy. Again, I say, rejoice. Isn't that interesting? That when, when the command came to always be joyful, it was in the context of there's a disagreement there. Do you know that joy is God's answer to discord? Joy is God's answer for discord. What kind of joy? It was be joyful in the Lord. You know what happened? The joy they have in the Lord is so big, but they allowed, they allowed what they had is a disagreement, what they had that they were not in common about to become bigger than the joy they had in the Lord. The joy that we have in the Lord is so much bigger than anything we don't have in common. It is so much bigger than anything we disagree on. Think about this. What is our, if you're in Christ, what is our common joy in the Lord? Oh, here, let's start with this right here. We've been called out of darkness, saved from eternity in hell, our sins forgiven, sins that we could never, like we could never pay that debt. Jesus paid that for us. Oh, we have uncontainable joy, and we all have that in common. We have the joy of knowing that the King of Kings, the creator of the universe, is walking right beside us, living inside of us. We have all that in common. 
We have in common that through the worst of times and the best of times, he's walking right with us and even carrying us through those moments. We have this in common. Jesus, our soon coming king, is coming back for all of us. Come on, if we would focus more on the joy we have in common, if we were filled more with his joy, we would be filled less with offense. The joy that we have in the Lord is so much bigger than the offense, than the disagreement, than the opinion, than the angst. The joy in the Lord, joy is God's answer to discord. And come on, we know, don't we, right now, that across the world that we live in right now, there's so much discord, so much division, so much angst, so much ugliness, all the more that the joy of Jesus inside of us needs to be visible. It's got to be seen. A joy from another world, God's own joy living inside of us. Joy, it's a sign of spiritual maturity. What else do we know about joy? Joy is cultivated or corrupted in your mind. Yet often joy is either cultivated or corrupted in your mind. So guard your mind. You and I, we have no neutral thoughts. The thoughts that you have are either cultivating or corrupting joy. That's why the Proverbs 4.23 says, Hey, above everything else, guard your hearts, guard your mind. Guard what you're letting inside of you. So a couple of days ago, I walked outside, and the kids were going to come uh, spend the night and hang out, and, and somebody gave us a couple of years ago a quad. That's a thing that has four wheels. That's why the name quad, you drive it around. And someone actually gave this to us. And so uh, I, I, I said, I need to go check, make sure the battery is charged up. And I opened up the, I pulled the seat off, and, and all of a sudden I see this giant mouse trap right by the battery. Mouse trap. Mouse nest. There's a mouse nest there. It, it, I should have had a trap there. So there's a mouse nest there. I thought, well, I'll just pull it out. I grab it. All of a sudden, the mouse jumps out. Like, ah! It's just a little guy, but it was unexpected. It's like, you're not supposed to be in there. If I let you stay in there, like you're going to start chewing through wires and mess things up. And what I want you to know is, if we are not careful with what we allow in our minds, it will chew things up. It will so mess up your world Choose your thoughts widely. Listen, we think 50,000 thoughts a day. That's a lot of thoughts. Do you know that 90% of people, their, their thoughts are about something negative that happened the previous day? An unkind word, an unkind action. We have to choose our thoughts. That's why Peter went on to say, or Paul went on to say, hey, think about these things. Fix your thoughts on these things. Like we get to choose where we're going to fix our thoughts. So I said, hey, fix your thoughts on these things, on thoughts that will cultivate the joy of Jesus inside of you. Instead of thoughts that will just corrupt the joy of Jesus. Again, it's that word if. If we're led by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will produce. We just have to cooperate with him. He will produce inside of us love. Joy in peace. We just get to cooperate. We get to walk where he walks. We get to walk in love and forgiveness when we want to hit back. What a beautiful journey he takes us on. Verse 9 of Philippians 4, he says, I'll paraphrase, he says, okay, now is really the hard part. Make sure you practice all of these things. This is where the rubber hits the road. The hard part is in actually practicing this. To practice being filled with the joy of Jesus when you've been through the worst of times. To practice forgiving. To practice being kind. Yeah, I know some people, when I think of joy, uh, I always think of a smile. And I, I know people that their natural facial disposition, like if they relax their face, facial muscles, they smile. And it's not that ridiculous, but, but they do just, when they relax their face, there's just this natural smirk. I'm like, that is so, and it's not like the joker, it's not creepy, it's just a natural. I mean, that is so cool, I wish I could do that, and I don't, I don't think I naturally do that, but what I, in practicing joy, you know, I think about that. I'm at the gas station the other day, and I'm just practicing, I'm sitting there pumping gas, and I, and I thought, I wonder what my natural expression is. 
I'm so sick of their advertisements. You can't even buy gas without them advertising something. So I want to hit the machine, but it's no, filled with joy, <laughs> choosing my thoughts. So I'm, I'm, so I'm got... <laughs> I don't know what it looks like for you to practice. I'm telling you, the rubber hits the road when you practice. Practice these things. A healthy body doesn't just happen. You've got to make some decisions, don't you? You've got to say yes to some things and no to other things. You've got to say yes to exercise. Yes, eating those, those green, that green stuff. Broccoli. I forgot what it was called in the first service. Broccoli. I had some last night. You've got to say yes to some things. I'm trying. You're clapping. I'm trying. I'm practicing. Practice saying yes to some things and practice saying no to other things. If you want a healthy body, you got to say no to Twinkies, no to Doritos. Doritos have 76 degrees, no, 67 ingredients, most of which you can't even pronounce. Probably not healthy, right? So practice saying yes to some, and I practice saying no. Get to practice saying no to some thoughts and yes to other thoughts. This participation with the Holy Spirit in this is found in Ephesians 4.23 when it says, Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. Let. That's a cooperation. It's not autopilot. Let the Spirit do that. Let Him take the lead. Romans 12.2, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God, tra- let God transform you into a new person. How? By changing the way you think. If we cooperate with the Spirit, He'll change the way we think, and that will change our lives. It will change our home. It will change our family dynamics. I was in my office um, some time ago, a couple years ago, and I noticed there was a, a little bug jumping on me. Like, what is that? And I look down, and it, I think that's a flea. And I know that, you know, my dog doesn't have fleas, so I thought. And I, I don't normally have fleas, so how? This is really bizarre that there's, there's fleas in my office. I caught it. I captured it, and I had someone else confirm that it was a flea. And so I, I began investigating. I learned that fleas, while they're small, like, they're bloodsuckers. Like, they'll, su- they'll suck your blood. They can transmit diseases. And I got to thinking, in terms of the way we think, that some of you might think, well, Pastor Gabe, you're just talking about, just trying to get us to feel good about life, and we should have positive thoughts. No, I'm talking about what the Holy Spirit does. And if we allow what seems so small, a toxic thought, if we allow that to be in there, it will suck the life out of you. It will transmit something in you that you don't want in you. If we want to be filled with the joy that Jesus has, we've got to make sure we're really cautious about what we're allowing, what we're allowing ourselves to think about and dwell on and meditate on. Okay, here we go. Let me tell you one more thing about joy, and that's that joy isn't really just for you as beautiful as it is. As beautiful as it is that you can leave here today saying, God, thank you. I don't have to live without your joy. I don't have to live without that. When? In the worst of times when my heart aches and when everything's going great. God, thank you. I don't have to live without your joy. And as great as it is to have the joy of Jesus living in you, I want you to also know that joy isn't just for you. No, it is, it is your destiny to be a source of joy for somebody else. Isaiah 65, verse 18 says this, Be glad, rejoice forever in my creation, and look, I will create Jerusalem as a place of happiness. Her people will be a source of joy. That's the New Living Translation. This is coupled with Revelation 21, speaking of God creating a new heaven and a new earth. And in the midst of that, he reveals his intention for Jerusalem, the people of Israel, by which we are, through faith in Christ, we're grafted into that same family. He said, here's my heart, that you will be a source of joy. Oh, so joy isn't just for me. I'm supposed to be the one that becomes the source of joy for somebody else. Do you remember about a year ago when nobody could find toilet paper? (laughs) 
Where's the source? Where did it go? Where do you get it from? Well, do you know our world right now, they're not looking for toilet paper, but I promise you they're looking for joy. They're looking for inward calm to all the chaos going on. And according to God's word, it is God's desire. It is his intention that you and I, we are that source of God's joy for somebody else. Romans 14, 17 says that the kingdom of God is not about a bunch of talk. It's not even about what you eat. God's kingdom is about peace in the Holy Spirit. We can't, in other words, we can't even represent God's kingdom outside of walking in, following the Spirit's lead and walking in peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's, that's what should exude from our life, so much so that we become a source of joy for others. You could ask yourself in your home, in your school, in your workplace, what are you a source of? What is it you provide for everybody else? Are you a source of I mean, you have to fill in the blank. Are you a source of annoyance? Or are you a source of joy? Do people know that when you're going to be around, that something ugly is going to happen? Or, oh, I know, something good is going to happen. Like, I just like being around them. There's something different about them. Pastor Joanna said it so well a couple weeks ago. She said, the greatest evangelism isn't always in what you say. It's rather waiting until someone asks you a question. Why are you so filled with joy? Why is it like that? Well, what a great opportunity then to explain, oh, hey, I wasn't even always like this, and this isn't even just my joy. It's actually God's joy inside of me that you're seeing. The fact of the matter is people hurt. Everybody who has a pulse has pain, and people go through real struggles. And some that struggle gets so it gets so big and so real, they feel like throwing in the towel. For some, that struggle, that pain gets so big, it becomes like something they can't seem to get beyond. What if God's plan was, is that you would be the source of joy that they need? What if God intended it to be in such a way that we walk out of this place not saying, oh, I should be more joyful, I'll practice that, but no, we actually experience Jesus filling our lives even more so, this is the Spirit-filled life, with his joy, so that as we walk out of this place, every person we come in contact with comes in contact with the level of the joy that Jesus has. And in a world that is filled with massive depression and anxiety and discouragement, I'm telling you, joy is needed, and people are looking for it, and we can bring that. Would you help me do that? The Spirit will work relentlessly if we cooperate with the Holy Spirit. He will work relentlessly inside of you, not on autopilot with your cooperation, to develop in you and in me, in us, love, joy, and peace. I'm almost out of time, so I don't have time to do a whole sermon on peace, but I'll give you an assignment. And, and, and someone's like, well, thank you. I don't really want another one anyway, Pastor Cap. Thank you very much. But I'll give you an assignment. Would you read this week Psalms 23? Isaiah 26, 3. Those, goes back to our thoughts again. Those whose thoughts are fixed on me, they will walk and live in perfect peace. What is Psalms 23? Some people say John 3, 16 is the most well-known verse in the Bible. Maybe, I think it might be Psalms 23 can transform your entire life if you let this get inside your soul. I would encourage you, don't just read it this week. Commit that to memory. Why not just say it every day? Why not plan at least five times a day? You're going to say, walk all the way through Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything that I need. Woo! I'm not freaked out anymore. I've got everything I need because I have my shepherd. And look what he does. How could I not have joy and peace when I have my shepherd. And look what he does. He leads us, guides us, actually makes us rest, and then guide, guides us and leads us to peaceful streams. Not a raging river, but peaceful streams. The Spirit will lead you to a place of peace you could never get to on your own. 
So much so that even when, verse 3, that you hit the darkest of days, even when it's the worst of the worst, you'll not be afraid. Why? Because you know your shepherd is close beside you. That's right, God, who holds the whole world in between his fingers, he'll grab you by your right hand. His strong arms will pick you up and carry you through what you're going through together with you. He is the good shepherd. He's good. He's known for his goodness. His rod, his staff, they protect, they comfort me. He anoints my head with oil. Surely my cup, my life overflows with his joy and all of his goodness. So much so that he even prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. That seems odd, doesn't it? Like if I'm going to sit down with a meal with God, I don't want my enemies there. But God prepares a table for me right in the presence of my enemies. So it's in the presence of what seems difficult. It's in the presence of ad- adversity, in the presence of everything's gone wrong, that right there in the face of all of that, God makes a meal for you. Surely, oh, certainly, his goodness, his mercy, they will pursue you all the days of your life. So I pray for you today, friend, that if you do not know Jesus, if you know about him but don't know him personally, if you've never crossed that line of faith, I pray that today is going to be your day. Today's your day to get now, today, adopted into his family, to have the joy of Jesus moving in on the inside of you. I pray for each one of us. That each one of us, God would baptize us, fill us fresh with his joy. And we're going to practice walking and being led by the Spirit all week long. Do you know, I'll close with this thought, do you know how when you're around somebody you start to pick up some of their characteristics? Some of their mannerisms begin to rub off on you. If they're sarcastic or if they joke or whatever they do. Well, you know what? I want, I want us to end this way today. I want you to get around Jesus whose big desire is that you would be filled with his joy. Because I want his joy to rub off on you. Thank you for tuning in with us today. If you are new to watching us online and would love to connect with us, you can send us a message through our social media platforms on either Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter at Mount Hope Church. We would love to see you at Growth Track. Growth Track is a place where you can connect with new people and learn how to get more connected to the church. It's only four weeks, and the first week starts on the first Sunday of every month. Easy! All of those links can be found in the description below. Let's continue to pray, to love, and to serve the people around us, just like Jesus would. We hope to see you soon.